My name is V. I used to be the coolest cat in this town. If only coolness could get your body stronger. But that was not the case for me. This is my story of how I became a heretic. Ooh, sounds like foreshadowing. I bet you can't wait to see what happens and why our V is a heretic. Well, it's been a hot minute since the original Beating Cyberpunk Only Being Cool video. And well, now that the skill trees are being nuked from orbit, survived the nuclear winter, and mutated back into the perfect life form, it's time to return to upgrade our cool cat. With the release of Phantom Liberty, skill trees were completely overhauled and now look very different. No more do we feel the cold-blooded chill in our veins. It's all headshots and throwing knives now, baby. Just like the original challenge run, the rules are the same. One, I cannot level anything except cool. Two, we are playing on the hardest difficulty. And three, we are going for the secret ending. We're also gonna be completing the Phantom Liberty campaign as part of this. So buckle up, grab some spunky monkey and a Mr. Whitey, sit back and relax. So like before, I will be using a save editor to reduce all other stats down to zero, which will make it so I can only level the core skills of the cool tree. In 2.0, they did away with the sub perk trees in favor of a single tree for each attribute. The cool skill tree now focuses more on headshot damage and throwing knives, though it does have some helpful skills like focus that allow you to slow down time when ADSing. So once again, it's time for our right man in the wrong place to make all the difference in the world. Our street kid from Haywood marches back into the limelight, ready to tackle whatever NC has to offer. Our story begins as they all do, with a botched robbery uniting two friends. Jackie and V are ready to conquer the city and become legends. They build up a bit of their reputation, saving Sandra Dorset and securing their first big gig with Dexter Deshawn. Now, much like last time, I still want to acquire the double jump in optical camo cyberware since both are still extremely helpful and the cool skill tree has a lot to offer when it comes to optical camo. I also just want to touch on how the consumable and armor systems were overhauled. Consumables are now infinite for grenades and healing, but are on a cooldown. You get two grenades and two healing items to start with, and each have their own recharge. This means less euro dollars spent buying meds and grenades. And also, well, we actually have some this time instead of running out all the time. Armor is also completely retooled. It now almost all comes from cyberware instead of from clothing. Personally, I think this is a great change, and with the ability to upgrade the rarity of cyberware now, makes it all the better. They also removed the attribute restrictions on most of the cyberware. So that means we can use the Send Devastan, which is going to make things much easier. Our goal is to create a build that can dish out crits, but without the ability to put points into Reflex, we really have to rely on Cyberware to help us with that. The Sandy is one step towards that, but we also need to acquire cool attuned augments since it will boost our headshot damage potential. But enough number crunching. Let's get back to our story as I prepare V for the big heist, earning money and experience to get everything I need. This takes a bit, but I like to be prepared. We take care of Dex's shopping list and we prepare to enter Compeki Plaza. Things go about as well as they always do. Heist goes well, then it goes bad, then there's some patricide, and then, well, Jackie takes a bullet for his pal. So just your average day in Night City. Though normally when you die, you don't come back from the dead haunted by the one. Whoa. So with the relic heisted, there's really not much more prep that I need to do, so I can really just focus on the story, with a little bit of side content sprinkled in to help us level as we go. My goal is to have the ending ready to go before we start the events of Phantom Liberty. Also based on my previous experience, probably to be max level, just, just in case. Alright, so now to go for the cyberpunk checklist. First off, we got Evelyn to get for information. V's hoping she has what he needs because, well, she did set up the heist after all. V enlists the help of Judy to sneak into a scav hideout once again. Man, I guess I really can't help writing the video like this despite it being the seventh time I've done this. I mean, I want everyone to understand the story, but maybe it's time we made this a little bit more concise. Evelyn proves quick to liberate without much issue, and we give the new and improved Mr. Hands a ring to get in contact with the VDBs. While we wait, Pan Am helps us secure Hellman by eliminating her ex-business partner. Yes, yes, we go to the den again, but I know people are sick and tired of hearing about it, so I'm just gonna leave a footnote. Sparknotes version, Pan Am happy, Nash dead, Hellman captured, yeah! 
Next, V gets a call from Mr. Hands and visits the Voodoo Boys to round up some strays at the Grand Imperial Mall. Doesn't take much for our cool cat to waltz in and go to town on this pound. The alpha of the animals proves a bit challenging as she has been reworked to be a bit smarter, but V manages to take her down with little cunning and some fancy shots to the dome. V says nah -uh to Netwatch and the Voodoo Boys zero him for his trouble. But the VDBs didn't count on this Lazarus making a comeback. Pissed as hell. Well, they do help him contact Alt. He gets a little bit blinded by revenge and well, they're all on the floor now and we won't be hearing from them again. With Alt in our back pocket, it's time to help our Ronin, Takamura. Takamura forgot his keys on Hanako Arasaka's parade float. So he tasks V with retrieving them. V takes a back way into Arasaka's industrial park and silently gets to Hanako's float. But the keys aren't there, so Takamura asks V to take control of the float so that he can ask Hanako where she took them. In order for Takamura to do so, V needs to take down some snipers guarding the parade so that Takamura can get onto the float and talk to Hanako. But the problem isn't the snipers, it's the robots guarding them. So turns out they are much stronger than they were before. Which makes me very concerned for the secret ending, where you have to face off with two mechs at the same time. But that's something we'll have to tackle later. With the snipers out of the way, it's time for V to face Oda, and he's been hitting the gym since we last saw him. He's resistant to V's damage, and he can dish out pain in kind. Since V doesn't have an amazing cyberware capacity, his armor is always behind the curve. V resorts to using the stealth approach to give the opportunities to really hit Oda hard. After a few attempts, V is victorious, making sure to spare Oda. V and Takamura rendezvous at a hotel where he had brought Hanako. She is not willing to talk about where the keys are located and her goons show up. Seemingly, they fix T-posing Takamura, which is great. Also, it turns out it's easier than ever to save Takamura. Watch this. With Takamura safe, Hanako agrees to help V with his problem and give Takamura his keys back. Before we can make it to the finish line and head over to Dogtown for Phantom Liberty, V needs to set up for the secret ending, which means completing some of Johnny's quests. V takes Rogue on two dates, one to find Smasher, which isn't fruitful, and an actual date to a drive-in. Both leave V and Johnny bluer than a pair of blueberries. Well, that's kind of a bad analogy because blueberries are more purple, but I won't stir the pot. To make up for this, V meets with Johnny's old band member, Carrie, to have one last show with Johnny's band, Samurai. Wow, I feel like I never mentioned the band in all of my playthroughs. I know we talked about the concert before, but I never gave the context. I mean, it does make sense given my caliber of writing and how many small details I have to cram in like a 20 minute video. With the ending ready, V just needs to do a little bit of grinding before he's ready to listen to Songbird's Call. V helps his friends and makes a few enemies, all in the name of that sweet, sweet XP. Now, thinking back on this, I'm not sure leveling really mattered at this point. You don't really gain anything unless you assign attributes or perk points. Cool and its perk tree have long since been filled out by this stage, so I'm pretty sure I did this all for nothing. Old habits die hard, I guess. I mean, I would guess it has some effect on loot, but given how upgrades work, I don't think it's a big deal. Okay, phew. We have finished with the retrodden ground. It's time to set foot into new territory. Oh boy, new jokes, here I come! Earlier in V's adventure, he had received a mysterious call from a netrunner by the name of Songbird. She asked for his help in exchange for a potential cure for the relic technology. Wait, is that another one I never touched on? In case you missed it, the same technology that brought Johnny into V's world is slowly killing them. Snap back to reality. Songbird tells V to meet her in Dogtown, which is a somewhat independent nation inside of Night City. It's run by an ex-Militech colonel, Kurt Hansen, who likes to talk a lot, so yeah, he's gotta be the big bad. Once V arrives outside of Dogtown, Songbird shows her skills by taking control of the relic and evicting Johnny for a bit. She works for the president of the new US of A, Rosalind Myers. Space Force One is out of control and going to crash into Dogtown, and she wants V's help to save her. V has to break into Dogtown first though, so it's parkour time. Once inside, V finally gets to see what's in the stadium, which I was excited for after how empty and unused it was before. But to get inside, there was a shuttered door which required three body to open. So unfortunately, the run is dead. This is what I was alluding to at the beginning. Officially, I lost the challenge. Unofficially, 
Of course I continued anyways, making sure to reset my skills after opening the door. Man, my first failed challenge run. Hate to see it, but I guess it happens to all runners at some point. V watches as Space Force One is shot out of the sky and crashes into downtown Dogtown. V rushes to the president's side, being sure to take out Hanson's guards swarming her location. V finds President Myers pinned down and jumps to her assist, or would if there wasn't a mech guarding the escape. Good thing the president has a strong jaw. After a few attempts, they make their escape into the city by stealing a cop car. They take cover in an abandoned hotel, but not before Hanson's guards find them. They must defend themselves while Songbird brings a mech online to help. This doesn't go so well as these guys hit pretty hard, killing V in one to two hits. But after mastering the technique of hiding behind pillars, the mech comes online and eliminates the goons. But Songbird loses control of the mech and goes silent as the 100 ton death machine causes major destruction as it chases our protagonist and friends. They manage to damage it on the lower levels, but it's up to V to silence it once and for all. Not a walk in the park, I can tell you. This thing hits hard, and you have to damage it in precise weak points. It will also summon repair drones to repair itself, which are annoying to take out. Robots are really where the build fails, so it takes V a few attempts before he can take out the mech. With the mech dealt with, V and Rosalind escape through the sewers to a remote hideout where they expect to find Songbird, but she is nowhere to be found. Rosalind is worried about Song, so she emergency knights us into the FIA and tasks us with activating her sleeper agent, Reed. This is done through an old phone, which V is not sure what to do with. Reed tells him to meet in a remote location, where he and V go over the plan. First, Reed wants to get Myers out of Dogtown and back to Washington. Once the Eagle has landed safe on NUSA soil, it's time to locate Song. Reed and V go to a local bar to activate another sleeper agent, Alex. She is not too happy to see Reed, since she thought he betrayed the team in their last op in NC. Turned out, though, that Reed was the one who was betrayed and almost killed by Arasaka. The person who pulled that trigger was Songbird, but under President Myers' orders. Pretty juicy stuff if you ask me. It certainly thickens the plot. It takes some convincing, but Alex is on board as long as she gets a good retirement. She tells them about an XCI that is part of the Voodoo Boys, who is an expert runner. He would be able to trace the connection back between V and Songbird and hopefully reestablish it. Reed and V try to peacefully get access to the CI, whose name is Slider, but the guards are not so forthcoming. Maybe killing Mama Brigitte was a bad idea. Oh well. They take down the guards and sneak their way into Slider's room. There they force him to try to reestablish the connection, but he informs them the connection was formed using the Black Wall. This is a firewall created in cyberspace to prevent rogue AI from escaping and destroying humanity. The constructs beyond it are terrible, wanting nothing but the destruction of the human race. We also kind of made a deal with one of them already, so we're not exactly new to what's beyond the Black Wall. If the Black Wall fell, it would spell the end of humanity, and the fact that Song is abusing it doesn't bode well. Reed gives Slider no choice but to use the Black Wall to reconnect V and Song. This works, and V reaches her, but she tells him she's being held by Hanson, and that Reed and V need to sneak into Hanson's private hotel in order to save her. But before she can say more, the connection is terminated and Slider is killed by something beyond the wall. Now it's beginning to sound a lot like a heist. Hanson is holding a fancy party for all the rich and famous. 
that we need to sneak into. V gets in contact with Mr. Hands, who agrees to meet in person and give V some intel about the hotel, the Black Sapphire. Got to say, the new Hands is very different from the 1.0 Hands. Very well kept though. He gives V the schematics of the hotel, which will allow them to sneak into the party without being noticed. V gives the blueprints to Reed, and then they start devising a plan. The scheme is to swim through some flooded abandoned tunnels under the hotel, and then sneak their way into the upper levels, where they will change into some fancy suits. It's all very James Bond. V makes it through the tunnels and lets Reed into the service level. He must then play Overwatch for Reed as he sneaks his way to the other side of the catwalk. This doesn't prove too challenging as V keeps watch and takes out the guards with his sniper turret. Reed lowers a bridge for V and they slip into their suits for the party. V makes sure to take that sniper turret with him because it will be very useful later on. Mingling with the crowd, they look for Songbird, but when they locate her, things are not what they expected. Turns out that she came to Hanson willingly because she was dying much like V is. The creatures beyond the black hole were slowly taking her over and Hanson has the cure for both her and V's illness. Hanson shows up to whisk her away, but not without her re-establishing their link. She tells V her true plan, which is to betray Hanson and take the cure for herself. To do this, she wants V to impersonate one of the two netrunners that have the codes to extract the cure from an old mainframe. The core of this mainframe came from a long forgotten bunker underneath Dogtown that Hanson had discovered. It contained an AI that was capable of restraining the technologies for both the relic and the black wall. To become one of these netrunners, V needed to use a personality mimicking technology which required a personality imprint. To get these imprints, V needed to meet with these two netrunners who happen to be twins. They are playing roulette, so V joins them and well, why not make some money while we're at it? He schmoozes with the twins. This cool cat has no problem extracting what he needs. In order to ensure a perfect imprint, it's time to do one of the classics, an all or nothing bet. This doesn't exactly go perfectly, but V gets the imprint and is ready to make his escape. However, he's intercepted by Hanson, who lets him know that he has captured Reed and that he can leave quietly as long as V never comes back. V agrees and collects his bedraggled spy friend from the coat check. And you think they're gonna end there? No, it's time for heist number two. Song and V meet up for one last time remotely and she explains what's going on. Turns out she arranged the whole thing with the president since Rosalind had been forcing her to use the black wall to get an edge on other countries. She also knew that Kurt had the cure for her worsening illness. She traded the president for that cure, but not without a backup plan. V was that plan, saving the president so the world wouldn't fall into chaos. I can't say I agree with her methods, but the obvious parallel to V's struggle makes them even closer. She wants V to betray Reed and help her escape to the black clinic where they will develop a cure for her and V. Conflicted, V heads over to a Ripper to get his personality mimic technology installed. There he talks with Reed and lets him know about Song's plan. Reed tells V that he has a virus that can be used to incapacitate Song when they are uploading the codes to the mainframe to get the cure. V gets his face ripped off and replaced with the new tech, but it's still up to him whether the virus should be used. They kidnap the twins, but V is unaware that kidnap means murder in the spy world. Still unsure what to do, V and Alex assume the twins' personas and head to their meeting with Hanson. This goes without a hitch, and V makes it inside with Song. There they extract the cure, and V decides to betray Reed and Alex to help Songbird escape. Alex kills Hanson, but is unable to make it to V and Song in time to stop them. They make their way through the bowels of the stadium, encountering many issues with the guards here. Phantom Liberty kind of expects you to be relatively maxed out, so it's not really a surprise that things start to heat up here. They escape through the sewer, which is pretty much what you always do in these things. They go their separate ways, Song promising to call when she is ready. V spends this time doing some cleanup quests and gigs, helping Mr. Hands consolidate power in Dogtown, using the personality imprint of a prominent Cuban cartel hitman. V has no problem unplugging the power vacuum and makes sure that Arasaka doesn't take advantage of the new leadership in Dogtown. After everything calms down, Song contacts V and tells him she needs some help getting a flight to the moon. This happens to be where the Black Clinic is located. They work together to get into the space terminal in NCX. Things seem to be going well until Reed and Rosalind show up with an army 
to try and stop Song from escaping. See, Song decided to pay the Black Clinic in information about how the president endangered humanity, which is not a good look. They sneak around the terminal as all hell breaks loose and Myers' goons start an all-out war with the NCX security. Song and V are spotted by a chopper, and they have to keep their heads down while fighting through enemies. This proves tough, as both the heli and the enemies hit hard. It takes a few tries to make it down the hallway of death, but eventually they make it to the train terminal. The trains here will take them to the shuttle, but they are currently disabled. V must defend Song while she calls up a train. This was the hardest part of the whole DLC. Mind you, this wasn't an easy DLC by any means. But fighting off waves of enemies with limited cover is not the easiest thing. Eventually, V manages to beat back the onslaught, but the helicopter reappears, and V and Song have to use the black wall once again to escape. Kinda awesome if you ask me, but also pretty dangerous for both V and humanity. They make it to the train after dooming a few people to a life of eternal torment in cyberspace. They reach the shuttle, but of course, Reed is there waiting. Reed tries to convince V to bring Song in, and V tries to convince Reed to let Song go. Neither side really wins and it comes down to the fastest gun in the West. This was such a hard choice. Reed was such an interesting character, but the moral of the story is that no one was in the right and sacrifices must be made to survive. And the final sacrifice was just as bad as them all. Song lied. There was only one dose of the cure, but V understands her more than anyone and is still willing to strap her into the shuttle. Johnny and V watch it blast off and have one last heart to heart before the next big hurdle. With Liberty Phantomed and Hanako ready at Embers, it's time for the big finale. Hanako is as spitable as ever, but we really don't care because we're primed to take down Arasaka all on our lonesome. It's time to party like it's 2023. One nice thing they changed in 2.0 is now they have a save before you enter the tower, so you don't have to wait five minutes between each attempt. This saved me so much time to be sure. The assault on the tower is quite the struggle. The normal humans are not much of an issue, but the robots, the robots are as bad as I expected. I managed to use a method that kind of bugged out their AI and just slowly whittled them down. Next, I took down the guards, got their access key and made it below. Once on the lower levels, things aren't as bad as I thought and I nearly make it there in one fell swoop. But then the game crashed just as I was approaching Smasher. Motherfuckers got no love for me. A few more attempts later, and we have Alt all snuggled up in the Arasaka mainframe. All right, the home stretch. Just Mr. Smasher left. He's not that bad, right? Well, you see, while I was filming this, update 2.1 came out, which they buffed up the Smasher fight. And I mean by a lot. He has so much stopping power, pretty much killing me in one hit all the time. I spent multiple days trying to beat Smasher. Hours and hours and hours. Eventually I got into a rhythm where I could manipulate his AI to sit in a spot where I could hit him for the first two phases. For some context, the fight is split into multiple phases. Each one he kind of gets a new ability, making him harder and harder. They seemingly removed the ability to get headshots on Smasher, 
which is really bad for us since that's the main focus of our build. But luckily, I've picked up a really good knife, Headhunter. This iconic knife has the ability to mark a target and allow you to get headshot damage on the target, which returns the knife to your hands. This paired with Kurt Hansen's signature weapon proves extremely potent. Now, phase three is where things get hardest. No trapping Smasher's AI here. He also spawns in a few friends, which have no problem one-shotting us. I had to run away, doing just chip damage, which proved very challenging. The next phase was similar, firing rockets everywhere, teleporting, etc. Thank God I chose to use the Sandy because it was a lifesaver in this fight. And here's where I would show you the full run. But unfortunately, the only run that failed to record properly was the one where I actually beat Smasher. Anyway, here's a Wish.com reenactment of the whole end. Enjoy. Well, Adam, it looks like I've got you on the ropes. Survival favors the strong. You can't possibly defeat me with that knife. On the contrary, Adam, I can. This knife is the most powerful knife in all of the Night City. Headhunter has had the ability to kill you. Maybe at least a hundred times in a row of shooting you in the head. What? A hundred times? This is the first time for me. Oh yeah, sorry, I'm from parallel universes where every time I die I come into another one. Sorry about that. That sucks. This is lame. Why can't I be in every single universe? I mean, you are, you just, you know, don't respawn. Anyway, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna throw this knife at you. Hiya! Oh, I'm dead, you've killed me with a single knife. This is the worst day of my life. I should have stayed home and drank motor oil or something. Whatever you do as a cyborg man. <sighs> See, I told you. And now, on to Mikoshi. And that's a wrap. Cyberpunk 2077, not beaten with only cool. Curse you, shutter door, for what you've cost me! My perfect record. How could you? Oh, well. I still really enjoyed doing the run. Well, except for the Atom Smasher part. I wanted to rip my eyeballs out. This was my first playthrough of Phantom Liberty and of 2.0. I really liked both. Phantom Liberty really was amazing. From its story to its world, good through and through. I mean, would I say anything different? I really like the game. Um, yeah, I'm kind of simping for the game. Anyway, that's my review. Simp, simp edition. I hope you enjoyed this little adventure into Night City. Come back again soon, and maybe we'll have another exciting tale in Night City and beyond.